Man, this is an honor. It's your boy Don Cannon, the number one co-signer. Some call me a legend and a goat, but I'm here to say I just jumped off the porch with Dirty Glove Bastard. I'm here. What an honor. Holla at me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We right back at it, y'all. We got a legend coming through, y'all. The one and only Don Cannon jumping off the porch with us. What's that's up, right, bro? That's right, man. I'm here, man. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm happy to be here, man. Like I told you before, it's meant a lot to me. You know what I mean? Dirty Glove Bastard was one of the things that uh, Speaker Fox, uh, long live Speaker Fox, you know, I meant to her for so many years. She always used to keep this brand in her, in her mouth, and I, I love that part of it. It's like, man, I got to do anything I can to be a part of it. Word, you know? that's what's up, man. Yeah. And man, long live Speaker Fox, man. Mm -hmm. Much love, shout out to her. I mean, she's Dirty Glove family, that's Baller right. Z that's family. Right. You know what I mean? Just, just, just all the way around. So you know, it's a family affair. That's right, man. That's yes, right. sir. Yes, sir. So man, pleasure to have you, bro. Man, Don Cannon, legend. But I feel like realistically, you know, that you don't get um, the props you deserve, or you haven't been given, or maybe like I, I just want to have the opportunity to give you the flowers. I you appreciate know what I mean? that. I appreciate that. Um, on that tip, let me say it like that. But uh, let, let's get started, like where it started, bro. You from Philly? Yeah, I'm definitely from Philly, uh, West Philly to be exact. 5336 Master Street is where I grew up at. Um, anybody from Philly would know, you know, that's right around the corner. Right. Uh, from, you know, not too, cl not too far from Overbrook where, you know, Will Smith went to school. Okay. Um, Shoemaker, middle school. A um, couple places where, you know, it's just big spots in Philly that everybody loved. You know, right. West Philly was just that place where you go up to Parkside, play basketball, and you know, just hang out, man, all over the place. All right. Now, can you give us a can you give us a breakdown of, of, of what it was like coming up in Philly? Because I think that for, you know, a lot of our users, a lot of the people that's following us that might be from the South and the Midwest, a lot of us think of any place on the East Coast to be just like New York. So could yeah. you kind of break down like the vibe of Philly? And it's crazy you mentioned the the New York Philly uh, comparison because when I came to Atlanta it was the first thing they would call me is New York mm -hmm. but they would call everybody from up top New York right. and I'm like yeah I'm not from New York man I'm from Philadelphia yeah you know what I mean and then Philadelphia um, is a special city you know uh, we follow certain rules as far as you know how we hold ourselves it's a lot of um, it's a lot of black folk up there um, and in the history of it a lot of Islamic people okay. Um, a lot of our families have a lot of Islamic people in it, uh, Muslim and Christian. Um, there's a lot of history in that city. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of things that I grew up seeing uh, allow me to have a respect for uh, black history and what was going on. Uh, we had Wilson Good was a mayor of ours, Mumia. I'm sure everybody knows that story. Oh, yeah. Um, the move uh, movement, which was, you know, terrifying to us as we were growing up. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Philly just has a lot of history, a lot of culture, and it's so different from any up north city that anybody's going to visit. Uh, a lot of monuments. We've got the Liberty Bell, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, ben Franklin. Mm -hmm. uh, we got the Rocky uh, uh, statue. Mm -hmm. When you run up them steps, you got to do that when you come to <laughs> right, Philly. Right, absolutely. You know what I mean? Um, it's just a lot of, lot of history. Uh, a lot of downplaying on a lot of the superstars we made out of Philadelphia. Everybody from Gamble and Huff, you know, they had Philly International, which breeded all kinds of musicians and superstars all the way down to our rappers like Will Smith and Eve mm -hmm. and Siegel and uh, the Young Guns and every, everything they've done. And then, you know, Cassidy is just so many talented people and then even basketball players, you know, Lionel Simmons, you have uh, Wilt Chamberlain, mm -hmm. um, and, and a host of others. Uh, but I grew up just cultured. Um, I played basketball from nine years old all the way to 17. Okay. I did music from somewhere five, six age all the way up to now. Mm -hmm. um, and I learned a, a lot of it, you know. I'm naming a lot of legends, but there's so many more. You got right. Jazzy Jeff, you got Cash Money. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I said, yeah. DJ Cash Money. And Absolutely. then you got um, Steady Being Cool C. Um, and then on a hip on a basketball side, I always looked up to like Rashid Wallace mm -hmm. and those guys. So, um, like I said, it's a city you would love to be in. 
you learn a lot, a lot of stand up people there. And, uh, you know, 85 percent of me is Philadelphia. Wow. You know Would I mean? you say there's a lot of pride that comes with being from Philly? Like, do people coming from Philly look at all that history and sort of move with that when they move to other places? Yes, they do. Because, you know, when I was coming up in Philadelphia, a lot of our pride came from not knowing that some of those people could be your family members. Mm. So, you know, I could be doing all this and wind up knowing like, oh, Wilt Chamberlain was my great uncle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or this is my my father's brother's best friend. Uh, yeah. uh, I grew up, you know, my father was friends with Stan Lathan, which was the mm. one who did Fresh Prince and mm. all the movie stuff. I never knew that. You know, yeah. his daughter is Sinai Lathan. Wow. Yeah. You know, you just come mm. up with this pride of, hey, we, we breed excellence. Mm. And I think our city gets downplayed that and like a lot of other cities just based on the violence and right. and the trials and tribulations that we got to go through. So they always call our cities uh, crabs in a bucket mm. and all that. But at the same time, um, we came up fighting from those statements. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We all grew up in oppressed spaces and just trying to get to the right channels. But we always used our pride to climb up out of the basket that they so-called said we were in. Yeah. And um, I'm just happy to be a part of that city. It's just never gonna leave me. We, right. just, we just breed it and the people that make it out always, uh, mostly, I would say most, <laughs> most of us, yeah. uh, shelve energy back into the city. Right. Yeah. So can you remember like when you first uh, started like finding your love for music and for hip hop? I first found my love in music uh, when I, first could start thinking about music was probably about 10 or 11. Okay. Um, I always tell the story about when I was young, my mom said I always would cry until they put music on. When the music came on, I stopped crying. Right. Music go off, I was crying. Mm -hmm. So they figured out it was something up with music and me coming up that, uh, that I needed, they needed to figure out. Mm -hmm. uh, three years old, I think I got my first turntable, it was like Sony, my first turntable with a Michael Jackson Thriller record. Oh, wow. um, and then somewhere at five, six, I got, you know, I started, you know, mixing. I did my aunt's wedding and around eight or nine, or I can't remember, it's just so, I'm so young. Mm -hmm. um, nine, 10, I got into uh, rap music. I used to go around to uh, King James Record Store, which was uh, not too far from the house. And I, and I think I bought Raising Hell. I bought uh, Biz Markie's album. Uh, I bought, what was uh, some of the, um, X-Clan. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I bought yeah. Cool C. Um, I bought Steady B. I bought a lot of albums at that time. And then, you know, sometimes I bought the bootlegs when I ain't have, you know, because yeah. I used to, you know, wash cars and do things for money so I can buy tapes and yeah. CDs and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think my love from hip hop came after I started buying those albums, even listening to the albums that I couldn't listen to, like right. NWA as a little, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and my love started around there in 1991. I think The Chronic and Doggy Style was, and were those records where I was like, oh, I really love music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was 10, 11 years old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um, people always ask me, when did you know you wanted to do this? I didn't. It's brushing teeth to me. Mm -hmm. I, I always was in it. I yeah. never got a chance to look up and say, oh, I really want to do music. I yeah. just did it. Word. It was just something I was doing. And so then how did you actually start dabbling into it? Like, did you start out trying to rap or did you start or did you know that you wanted to be a DJ producer early on or? How I started is I, I did everything all at once. I was DJing. I was rapping, making beats. Mm -hmm. um, so I started rapping at age eight or nine. Okay. And what I would do was I would make my own beats. I, they had these things back in the day. I didn't know this was called this until now. We did these things called pause tape. So basically you would take one tape and say it was James Brown. Mm -hmm. You'll find a place that you wanted to rap on it and have a blank tape on this side and you record that willow piece, press pause, mm -hmm. go back and keep recording until you got three minutes worth of the beat. Ah. I would take that, put it in a karaoke machine mm -hmm. and then I would rap on it. Yeah. And that was my demo. Right. So that's where I started really getting into it. Uh, I had a cousin named Keith and he was like the Snoop Dogg to me. I was Dr. Dre mm -hmm. and I would do all his beats. Uh, and that's how I really started getting going. You know, sometime in high school, I really left the rap alone and I got into, um, I got into mixtapes. But mm -hmm. the funny thing is when I was going to high school, with my mixtapes, I didn't have exclusives. Mm -hmm. I only had a few white labels that I got from the record store, but everything else came from 
other people's mixtapes. So it right. was like Clue and, yeah. you know, these guys, I would record the part that they're not talking on, put yeah. it on my tape, take it to high school, give it to people and make my <laughs> name. Yeah. And that's what, um, and that's what really I knew. I was like, oh, I'm getting into something. I'm starting to gain pop- uh, popularity. Mm-hmm. By the time I came to Atlanta, it just started flipping over for me. Where, where? So then were you heavy? Were you, were you heavy rapping? Like even before you came to Atlanta, like were you more rapping than producing or you were just doing everything just trying to get in the door? Uh, I started rapping, like I said, like around eight, about 12 years old, I stopped rapping because I realized that my beats were way better than what I was rapping. Gotcha. And I thought I was a crazy rapper. But I think what happened was I enjoyed the process of building stuff. Uh, as a kid, you have multiple talents and multiple things that you want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. I think I, I wanted to be an architect at one time and play basketball. So I kind of like added all these things together. Wow. So the basketball part was just conditioning. Architect was building. So I think that architect love uh, went into music and I was building tracks and building things. I didn't feel like building a song from a rap standpoint really had me. It was yeah. the music. It mm-hmm. was making it, you know what I mean? Finding the records, manipulating them. Yeah. Uh, watching DJ Premier do that thing, do those things in, you know, the gang star days and me manipulating it in my way at 12 years old, you know what I mean? Until I was able to take the training wheels off. So I was watching him and Pete Rock and I think I just got influenced heavy into the production of it, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. So when you came to Atlanta, was it a difficult transition in terms of like, uh, you know, the music that, um, was was dominant, you know, down here versus what you were hearing like up in Philly? Or were you already, since you were a DJ, kind of playing a, a lot of variety of stuff anyway? Um, the transition from Philadelphia to Atlanta was a little different. I'm going to tell you why. Because my senior year, when I was working out for basketball, uh, I was listening to AT Aliens okay. and, uh, and Outkast a lot. Um, even prior to that, we were listening to Criss Cross because we was young. Oh, yeah. uh, so we had a respect for South, but I didn't know until I got to Atlanta what Atlanta was all about. Mm-hmm. When I came to Atlanta, I expected it to be uh, ghost town DJs and bass music. I got down here and um, they were hanging out the cars, throwing <laughs> bowls, yeah. you know, and looking at you. Yeah. You know, It was just a different culture and I, was, I wasn't ready for it because, you know, in Philly, when somebody say, what's up, what you mean, what's up? You know what I mean? Here yeah. was like Southern comfort. It was right. like the first people, couple people said, what's up to me in Atlanta? I was looking kind of crazy like, yo, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So uh, it was different. I came down here. They was loving uh, Master P. They were loving um, Pastor Troy, Cash Money. Um, they had some things we had like um, uh, Sammy Sam. It was stuff mm-hmm. that people was listening to that I wasn't quite getting yet because yeah. I just was just getting here. I'm like, what's going on? Where the right. bass music at? Where's Freaknik? You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. I'm like, what's going on? Like, yeah. I thought we was in Atlanta. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, that was the culture shock. And I really was like, oh, okay, it's a different vibe now. You know, I went to 559 as a freshman. He was in there and everybody was, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I was hearing joints. So when I went back home uh, the summer after my freshman year, and I was going home and I was, I act like I was damn near from Atlanta. I was on some, how you do that there? And it was like, yo, why are you talking like that, bro? What's yeah. up with you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, I was just on it, bout it, bout it, tip. I was just on it. And then I just started seeing Cameron and people that we looked up to mm-hmm. start getting involved with it. Like, man, that joint hot. And then the year I came back, that next summer I came back, everybody was listening to everything. Master wow. P, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I was like, damn, I got the first take on everything. Wow. You yeah. know, going back. And it, it was a culture shock because I always say Atlanta was a melting pot. When we went to school, it was people from everywhere. Mm-hmm. So when, you know, everybody came from all over the country, they took all that stuff back freshman year for that summer, yeah. took it back to these prospective right. places, right. and everybody got hot. Yeah. So that's where I was like, oh, Atlanta just changed, you yeah. know what I mean? And even Outkast, it was like, we was loving Cast, mm-hmm. but uh, Master P, Pastor Troy, all them got, they just had a hold on Atlanta when I came down, Word. you know what I mean? And, and in those days, what was the difference in like the party scene in Philly and then coming here, like how different was it, you know, at these different college parties or just different parties you was at in the city? Um, the difference between college parties in Philly and here, uh, if you're in Philadelphia, there was a variety of music being played. So you would have dance music, you know, Baltimore House, like 
uh, all that type of, you know, go ahead, girl, put your leg up and all that. Yeah, like, yeah. we was listening to that in the club plus uh, Jay-Z plus this, but I hadn't heard any South yet. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, our whole high school, when we went to the dance joints, they was just, everybody was doing, you know, dance and, you know, just hearing like breaks, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, Puerto Rico, oh, like that's what we was on. Wow. We was listening to them joints and just real hip hop. Mm -hmm. I came down here and it was all Atlanta. Mm -hmm. It was, you listen to Ghost Town DJs, you was listening to Master P, which is, you know, um, Southern, yeah, but Louisiana, we yeah. took it in. You had Pastor Troy, you had all those artists I named before, but we was listening to them in a club. Yeah. And I think at some, t at some point, um, there was like a 15 minute New York set, you know what I'm saying? Which was, New York was DC up, so you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and that was just the set. And when I started DJing down here, I had to kind of get to that set. Like I wanted to break some of the uh, dance down here mm -hmm. stuff, but I also wanted to get into the culture here. So wow. I just started playing stuff back and forth. And like I said, it was a culture shock because it was like, it was some stuff I could play from up north that people was looking at me like, all right, man, you, you fucking the party up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I got in a space where I was like, hey, man, make sure the crowd is happy with what you're moving and just making sure that uh, the party is right. right. So that, that was the difference in the sound. You okay. know what I mean? Do you remember like some of your first DJ gigs um, down here when you? Yeah, some of my first DJ gigs, I always tell people this too, like when I'm just in mentoring and all that. Um, was in a, was in the cafeteria at Clark mm. and on the promenade, and I would DJ them joints, and people would never go to their dorm and do their homework. I'd just be out there all day till they kick me off the joint, yeah. or just be in the lunchroom and tearing it up, starting the food fights. You know mm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, um, Tear the club up was one of the first records I was playing in the lunchroom that had food fights. Huh daily you know what wow. i mean i'm surprised i ain't get in trouble for that but <laughs> you know what i mean i was food fight ready anytime i just felt like yo i'm gonna stir this joint up a little bit yeah i played tear the club up you yeah. know what i mean yeah yeah uh, and that's how i got the start i think that alex giddy and and uh and biddy barnes mm -hmm. he had cloud nine and ag oh, entertainment yeah. oh, and they had their guys coming to the campus filling it out just getting new people recruiting mm -hmm. uh people to do stuff i think handing out flyers and stuff i think uh, they got wind of what I was doing, mm -hmm. and I wound up uh, transitioning to their clubs, just being an opening DJ mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And I think that uh, they saw the talent, and I was able to close a couple nights. But you know, the clubs that were you know were around when I first started was Chili Pepper. Uh, there was a club called Club New York, which was like I think it was uh, Atlanta Fish Market turned into, but I think that was oh, a club right. at first. Okay. Um, Chili Pepper, there was a living room, mm -hmm. it was in the Buckhead Clubs, then you had uh, the World Bar, Shadows, Fuel, uh, Chaos, mm -hmm. um, I was doing all them joints. It used to be a club right across from the Cheesecake Factory that's now closed down, mm -hmm. where the Buckhead shops were, and it, it was, uh, I was DJing in, uh, in the top floor next to Joe's Crab Shack, and ESPN Zone was there, so everybody would just be walking down the street and I'd be playing music. Right. they want to come to the club and be like, oh, it's rocking in there, you know what yeah. I mean? So those were some of my first gigs. I was coming down here. Of course, I did the college parties, mm -hmm. but the clubs were those. I did Karma with Drama. He was doing like the underground clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, just, just a lot of joints. Uh, there was uh, Velvet Room, mm -hmm. the original Velvet Room. Um, there was... Uh, uh, Club Kaya, okay. which turned into Visions later. Okay, yeah. Riviera, which turned into Club 112 later. You know what I'm saying? Then there was 112 that was up the way. I did Atrium out, you know, uh, they used to have a party called uh, the Lake Tex Party, which was the Lu Louisiana, Texas party. Oh, sure. And the other room would be New York. I did that room. Mm -hmm. Paul Wall would do the other room. Oh, all right. I mean? Okay, that's all right. Uh, and that was at Atrium because that was like the biggest club. I think mm -hmm. that was out in Stone Mountain. Yeah. Uh, so, I did a lot of clubs. I didn't do, the funny thing is, trivia, I never did any strip clubs. I never DJed no wow. strip clubs. Okay. Yeah, it was crazy. That was crazy. I went to them, but yeah. I never DJed. I just never got the opportunity. Yeah. You know what I mean? They yeah. had their shit already locked That's in. That's almost like unheard of. Where Ain't it crazy? Think, like every yeah. DJ would have almost had to like step through that circuit somehow. Yeah, I always hosted. I always came through. Yeah. But they already had they, their DJs lined up for all them clubs. So yeah. I just came through on a respect tip. Um, but I never really did those, but almost every club, uh, level three, mm -hmm. that was downtown, mm -hmm. uh, almost every club in the city, there wow. was, uh, 
I did all that. What would you say is like the hottest club that you DJ here in Atlanta? Like what? since I was since since I've been DJing in Atlanta, I think I made my name at Visions. Okay. Uh, during like the Jeezy days, the BMF days, mm-hmm. all those days, like I was killing those rooms. Any any star that came through, I was I was going crazy. Okay. I had I had that like four or five nights. Uh, a week. Yeah. I, I also did this room he built, uh, Alex built called the Glass Room, which was like the exclusive room where you didn't hear all the, the main hits, but you would come in there and hear them album cuts that you love. I made my name in that, in that room uh, going crazy. Um, I think Biddy Barnes uh, put me in that room okay. and I would just be in there just playing them album cuts you never heard and yeah. just jamming, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I think that I made, I had my most fun and made my name there. Um, Buckhead clubs, I used to kill, you know, uh, Fuel and all those, like, you know, Janet Jackson would come through at that time with Jermaine Dupri. Um, it was just a lot of vibe. Shadows, I was just killing those parties. Like, anybody that came up in this era can attest to me killing those clubs. Like, right. I was on fire. In the right. and, yeah. and you were DJing the clubs during the BMF era? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so I wasn't doing all the club, but I was doing a lot of clubs because right, I was right, at right, Visions, right. you know what I mean? Um, I just recently somebody just pointed out like all the all the clubs that we've done, mm-hmm. we had and did like something. Uh, it was certain clubs in Buckhead, like uh, what was the name of it? Like uh, ones I couldn't get in. Yeah. Like I never did uh, Club Don. Mm-hmm. Uh, I never did. Uh, I don't think I did. Uh, I forget the name of the one that was on the corner, but it was one that was on the corner that was through. I never did that joint. Okay. Um, but they were like, how you never did those clubs, but you did all the rest. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, you know, I did, I did the club, head, uh, the buckhead parties. I was killing those joints. Um, and I was making beats at the same time. So, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was handing out beat tapes, mixtapes and yeah. doing the clubs. Yeah. Every, yeah. 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 Like whatever you need, they, they can get it from you. That's right. That's <laughs> word, right. Word. So now I know you've told this story a bunch of times, but like, I don't remember like the certain details, like in terms of like with you drama and sense, uh, mm-hmm. all coming together, creating the affiliates. Did you guys meet here in Atlanta or did y'all actually know each other in Philly? I met drama and sense in Atlanta. Word. But it's crazy because we all had uh, we all had people trying to introduce us. Mm. So when I, I my, my my man Jabari uh, was like, "Yo, we go to Atlanta. I want you to meet DJ Drama. Mm. He goes crazy. He's already got he's already been working with people like the Roots and Bahamadi and all that. When you get down there, that's the person you need to see." Right. Uh, I had another uh, close friend of mine, Ace McLeod, which was down here. I met him in Philly, and I was in high school getting ready to come down. He was like, yo, you come to Atlanta, get with us, man, da 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 He was, you know, mainly with Sense. And um, when I came down here, I just, you know, I introduced myself to Drum and gave him some beats, and he wound up loving it. And, uh, and I wound up going to his crib and working with everybody he was working with. Wow. Uh, Sense is the same thing. I, you know, we hooked up. I gave him some, I gave him some beats. We started going back and forth with records and stuff like that and just going to their crib and DJing. We just formed a collective, you right. know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just how that whole brand was built. Word. That's what's yeah. up. And, you know, in some cases you hear, you know, when people are really close now, sometimes the beginning of their relationship might not have been that. Did you guys like hit it off like as soon as y'all met or was there like a little bit of time that it took for you guys to kind of build and develop that relationship? I always, I'm always funny with the story and I'm drum going to be mad, but he said that never happened. But uh, when I first met Drum, I walked up to him, I was like, yo, what's up, Don Cannon? I got these beats or whatever, whatever. I'm not, I'm sorry. I said I was Donnie Brasco. That was my name before before it was Don Cannon. And uh, and he was like, he was like, man, get out of here, young boy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Come on, come on, boy, get out of here. And, uh, you know, they they were a little older than me, so they were there already killing it. By the time I came down, I was still the young boy. So when I came uh, and met him, and he took the beats. That's when I, he was like, I'm, he took the beats anyway. Mm-hmm. But when he called me back, he's like, bro, I listen to your beats. Your joint's hot. We got to link up. But boy, he was treating me like, come on, boy, get out of here. <laughs> uh, since was, he, tre- it, 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 and I tell him, he might be mad too. Uh, he treated me like a young boy, but he still had his arm around me. Like, yo, you're going to be the next dude, da-da-da. But he, mm-hmm. you know, he used to be the first, he was the first person. They'd be like, yo, you should use your real name. 
and I was using Don Bra Donnie Brasco. And once I found out he was a cop, I was like, all right, I got to get rid of that. <laughs> but I never liked my real name, yeah. and my real name was Fire. Yeah. But he was like, come on, you Don Cannon. That's your name. Yeah. You know, F all that other shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he was the first person to hype me up in that, in that space. So I took to that. You know what I mean? Fire. I took So yeah. I got both of those energies. And, you know, we just kind of gelled. Like, it wasn't really no no space between us we were right. just rocking you know what i mean yeah, yeah yeah and i mean y'all came together and i mean literally changed like music history you know yeah. what i mean yeah. like everybody added man. something like drama had he was the vocals and you know sense came through with a sense of vision for people i had like the heart of it you know what i mean so we all just had something we was bringing to the table yeah. that made uh that made people kind of drive towards it it was no, like sure. you know what i mean yeah. there's something about this collective that we love so that's what um that's where it all came from like we all knew we knew our spaces we knew what we all could do what all each one of us could do and uh we made you know we made the best of it when right. we first started you know yeah no, that's yeah. what's up man i mean teamwork make the dream work and if you have team members that all know their roles and are comfortable in their roles then you can you can have that optimal success you know what i'm saying yeah no nah, nah that's that's the absolute truth bro yeah um would you say that like you know with everything that you guys accomplished um was there like anything during that mixtape era that like y'all didn't do that you wish like you know, damn, we was kind of cut short because of, you know, like the legal things that happened or things like that. Like, was there anything that you guys kind of had in the works that didn't get to come to fruition? Um, that's an important question. Nobody's ever asked the question if it's something that we thought we should have did during that era. Um, the era almost makes me look back and say, man, everybody we broke as a talent through mixtapes, we never got a chance to be a part of their business. Mm. We always just were people's business card mm -hmm. and you know we, we built a lot of strong relationships but we were never cut in on none of the business mm -hmm. and um you know i don't know if it's us to blame we were just out here just trying to make a name or or was it just not having the right teachings and i always say yo we never had like a russell simmons or like a uh kevin lyles come say yo i see what y'all young folks is doing mm -hmm. let me help y'all understand the business of it and I think we were just young and dumb and, and, and crashing out. We didn't know. All we knew was we loved music. We wanted to get somewhere. And this was the only way we knew how to do it, right. you know? Um, you know, a lot of people don't have to go through that because they had that mentor. Right. We right. didn't have it. You yeah. know, we had some people that were on our level mentors that we reached out to um, all the time. Um, but there was nobody that had really, really, really struck oil with it that came and said, yo, y'all it, let yeah. me do this with y'all. So that was the only thing probably that we didn't get a chance to do was really had a mentorship be a part of other artists' business outside of breaking them as an artist. Mm -hmm. It was never nothing signed to us like the affiliates or wrote in a deal because yeah. we helped them. And those are the things that probably would have helped us get a little further mm -hmm. uh, skin in the game, but you know, it is what it is. I'm happy with how it turned out. No, nah, for sure. Yeah. So you just spoke on like mentors. Um, how important is mentorship in the game? Having big homies, whether it's in the neighborhood or in these professional settings. Mentors are very important because, you know, as we're growing as humans, we learn by mistakes. So we tend to crash out a lot when we don't have somebody say, hey, I've been down that road before. Nobody told us. We would just crash out and learn from the mistakes. Right. So I think that mentor mentorship is very important. You know, uh, as I was coming up, I always tell people I wanted to be the best producer ever. And once I realized it was opinionated, I turned into the person that wanted to help break talent mm -hmm. and teach creatives to be, you know, how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and for a long time, you know, it, it, it comes off as a bad word when you're trying to be a leader mm -hmm. because, uh, people get, you know, fucked up so many times through their trials and tribulations mm -hmm. that they don't want to help nobody. Yeah. I'm like, when I get to the top, I'm going to show all these motherfuckers. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I ain't going to do shit. Yeah. Watch, they're going to they gonna be on my dick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, got, I got to a point where I was like, I don't want that to happen to me. I don't want to be that person that, that has that, uh, that kind of feeling towards people because they ain't helped me. 
Yeah. So I'm like, yo, whatever was done to me or whatever I didn't get, I'm going to make sure the next person gets. No, for sure. Because you can move with that chip on your shoulder, but then like you just keep that cycle going of not sharing the game. So mm -hmm. then you got, you know, these next generations or these next people coming up and yeah. you not getting game. Um, yeah, I use my chip as competitive. Like mm -hmm. I would be competitive with people, but yeah. not jealous and envy. Yeah, so I would I like be competitive. That but I will also help. Like, I'm not gonna yeah. stop and be like, yo, we running a race and I'm gonna trip you. Yeah. I'm gonna just run as fast as I can. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then if somebody in the stands comes and like, bro, I saw you in the race, win it. How'd you do it? That's my mentorship. Yeah. So that's, that's the two things I'm doing. I'm not about to trip you. I'm gonna win it fair and square, but I'm also gonna show the next person how I did it and where I pulled the energy from. Yeah. So that's where I stay like in the means of when, when I'm moving on a daily. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, can you speak on your role like within um, within your guys' team? And I mean, like from the mixtapes to the albums, things like that, like you're you're A&R, right? Yes, like, sir. You're in the studio, locked in, listening to this music, countless hours, all that. Can you speak? Can you speak? To yeah, that? essentially my position. I mean, some people think that they're bigger than being an A&R. I mean, A&R is just one tool on my tool belt, right? Um, sometimes I don't, I, I'm into the making of it that takes me out of the aspect of A&R. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by making it is like, I'm actually creating the product. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not leading the product. Mm -hmm. So some A&Rs are able to lead people to the water and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And that's artists and repertoire. Yeah. I'm actually crafting it. I'm pushing a button. I'm finding a sound. I'm chopping a sound. I'm giving an idea. I'm pushing the idea. I'm being there for the inspiration. It's a different vibe. So I think that's just one position that I have. Then I have the exec position that knows how to handle the business. Then I have a marketing uh, scale and creative idealist is what I call myself, that I know how to take people's visions to the next level. Uh, also, um, I'm actually a creative, you know what I mean? I do things that most people are afraid to do, create and, and, and take you know, push the culture to another level. Um, and those are and those are my roles, w which people say I have many hats, but you know, it could be more than I'm not thinking about. I right. just know that what I focus on is the best product possible. Mm -hmm. I try not to, you know, in my years as a creative, at, anybody knows a creative, we have emotions. Uh, we go through the pickiness, we go through all this stuff, but the one thing that I focus on is having the best product. Right. I don't want to argue about it. I don't want to fight back and forth. What is the best product? How can we make history? Yeah. That's what I like to do, make history. Yeah. Yep. So with, with A&R, um, you know, that's a position um, that over the years, like it seems like it has become less important or less valued um, as it once was, especially now that so many artists are able to record on their own, put something out, and if they have a certain amount of numbers, then they can get a record deal. So they don't necessarily have or even feel like they need somebody sitting with them, helping them create. Um, do you feel like A&R is a lost art? I don't think A&R is a lost art only because at some point, we can push as far as we want with the robots mm. and what we want to do in, in artificial intelligence. But we got to figure out how to add human behavior mm. because that's what gives it character. Mm. You know what I mean? We can have all the answers, all the information we want, but where's the human character? Yeah. So I feel like um, as much as we try to dead these positions, we still need human character to work mm -hmm. and live and move forward. Uh, A&Rs need to start doing the, their actual job properly. Mm -hmm. It's not just picking a song. It's not just finding an artist. It's doing the paperwork, mm -hmm. knowing where the sample's coming from, uh, connecting with the lawyers, connecting with people. These are all things that's w on the repertoire side. Right. When they call it A&R, I don't mm -hmm. know if people know, artists and repertoire. Right. It's not just songs, right. you know what I mean? You have to know everything. You know how to jot th things down. Uh, knowing the positions that everybody in the studio, knowing what the engineer does, knowing what the songwriter does, knowing what the producer uh, does, knowing how to put match the producer with the right producer or the right artist and the right songwriter. 
uh, known with songwriters. Some people don't even know there's different songwriters. You got somebody that does a top line and somebody that does a melody. If anybody watching this don't know what I'm talking about, there's people that can do melody and not write, but there's people that can write songs that don't have melody. So sometimes you can put those together to make the perfect song. Mm -hmm. Some people are from Mars, like Pharrell, that know how to write a song and do melody. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't get those all the time. But, you know, once you know, like, every single piece, that's what makes you a great a &R. You can't say you're an a because you found the right rapper or you found a producer. That's just not a &R. Hmm. It's all the stuff that comes with it. You yeah. know what I mean? And I learned that a long time ago. And, you know, once I knew everything that came with that position, I was like, oh, okay, I know so much more. I'm bigger than that position. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Wow. Right, right. yeah. So, um, I mean, so many classic mixtapes, I mean... You were a part of uh, a bunch of dope mixtapes like that you hosted that were some of my favorites. I mean, Rocco, Gift for Gab, too. Yep. Um, Currency, Smokey Robinson. I yep. mean, that is probably, you know, one of my like top three currency, you know, projects. Um, you know, that, that was just super dope. Yep. But um, with being a part of like all of those dope projects, like, did you ever feel like, um, did you ever feel like there was like more that like that like you could have been, I guess, like in terms of like producing and hosting the projects? Like, yep. was there like more that you could have been even doing like in terms of like those particular artists? I could have. Uh, I, I was the person that didn't want to get in the way of nobody. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't want to be selfish and be like, I need to do all the beats on this joint. Right, <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? And see, that's what I mean. I'm in the I'm in the I, the the. The product is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. It ain't because I brought it. It ain't because I'm going to be in front of it. I'm just being a spokesman for it. Right. You know what I mean? If you bring me a full entire project and say, here go my mixtape, I want you to host it. And I listen to it and say, hey, there's something I want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. I don't want to necessarily think it's going to blow up because Don Cannon did it. Gotcha. I want to be a part of it, but I, I want to, I, of course, I want to make beats and things on it. But if there's no room for it, I'm not forcing it. So uh, with guys like Rocco, that was a project he already had done. Mm -hmm. uh, even with You Don't Even Know It, I think at the time we were negotiating him wanting me to put the record out as a DJ mm -hmm. uh, record, mm -hmm. you know, or how we were doing it. Uh, also, the, um, the mixtape that he brought me was done. I'm not going to be like, man, I don't want to do it if I can't, you know, if you right. can't rap on my beats. It right. just would make no right. sense. That's not being, you know, an overseer or, or some sorts. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, shout out to Rocco. Currency, uh, you mentioned, that was somebody that was working with me from 2007, and we just clicked. Mm -hmm. And once we got a chance to come back around and do something, I felt like it was very important that we gelled and did something. Yeah. Um, some, he freestyled on some instrumentals that I did, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? We just had that relationship. You know, yeah. I don't know. I always try to take credit for this, and people can take it away from me, but I think I was one of the first DJs doing mixtape videos when I did, like, the Cool Kids videos. Mm -hmm. We were doing, like... Um, just, you know, the, the, the coming soon videos. I did the Trap or Die 2 videos. Mm -hmm. I, nobody was doing those yet. You know what I'm saying? I was yeah. doing the currency. We was at the Waffle House sitting there talking about the tape that's about to come. Like all that shit wasn't coming. That, that wasn't out yet. So um, that's one of the things I was experimenting with. Like, yo, how can I break these artists? You know, um, obviously at that time, me and Drum uh, had went separate ways for just a, you know, a tad and he was doing his thing. I wanted to see how I could separate myself and gotcha. do the best thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, doing those type of, you know, doing the, the Dom Kennedys and, the, mm -hmm. and the currencies and cool kids and Asher Ross. Like it was just a different vibe for me. And, um, I just wanted to see it out. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I, and I helped all those artists, even big Sean, you know, I met him at no ID spot early on and, and he was like, you no know, idea. was like, yo, you want to help this kid? I think he's super talented. He put us both in the studio. Um, I did some beats for him and we did the tape and it, it just took him to the next level. You yeah. know what I mean? I felt like um, that was real pivotal for his career. Right. You know, uh, we, we built a great relationship from that. Wow, yeah, and I, I was actually working at Def Jam at that time. That's crazy. And I was behind the scenes working with Big Sean and the whole team on That's all crazy. the mixtapes. That's so, crazy. Like me, Sean, Zeno, you know. Yeah, what I'm saying? Zeno, like, shout to Zeno. Yeah, yep. yeah, nah, we were all like, yeah, put, putting in the groundwork, you know what I mean, to build that foundation and all that. So, yeah, nah, that was ill. Yeah, that's um, important. So then, like you, so then you've produced like so many. I mean, classics. I mean. 
Lil Wayne, Cannon. I mean, yeah. like that right there, I mean, was uh, like that with the sample and, you know, all that, you know, was crazy. And then I think like, I, and then I remember back then I heard like a bunch of people remixing it and trying to, you know, do, do their own rendition of it. Yeah, I um, mean, that helped, that helped me because coming up as a producer, you want to work with everybody. I think with Go Crazy and Cannon, I think I've worked with everybody I ever wanted to work with in my life, except yeah, for Stevie yeah. Wonder. So, Man. I mean, that was a blessing that, that they, they made me level-headed and not really try to, you know, uh, go after all these names that I really wanted to work with based on how my stardom started. Yeah. I was able to work with younger folks and not overlooking them because I was on some ego shit trying to make, work with Ghostface, all these guys. Right. I got a chance to do it with two records. So. Yeah. That was dope. Word. So the Jeezy Go Crazy record yep. with Jay-Z. Yep. Um, can you talk about like how that came about? Like were, were you in the studio with Jeezy recording that? Were you like working with all of them recording? So what I, I, what I did was uh, the, the first time I, I initially made the beat was in my apartment. Uh, if anybody know, I had, you know, I had the machine. I was working on the, the hardware and I lost the, the, the floppy disk hmm. for it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So. Uh, when he actually, actually T.I., I bring it back further. Drum was managing me as a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, he used that beat, gave it to T.I., T.I. freestyled on it for one of his tapes. And um, he wound up not going any further with it. It was just a freestyle. Was, people was fucking with it. Mm -hmm. um, I wound up playing in the club and Jeezy heard it. And he was like, what you doing with that record? And I was mm -hmm. like, it's yours. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and knew in the back of my mind, I might have to remake this motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, uh, uh, what I did was I went to Patchwork and recreated it uh, in the B room and just had it ready for him, tracked it out. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yo, like a couple months later, I think he, he told me in drum, he was like, he talked to me, he was like, bro, I got something special for you. It's going to change your life. Right. I'm like, yeah, what are you talking about, man? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and what happened to be was Jay-Z. And, you know, uh, I grew up being a Jay-Z fan and for him to be on my my I always say my second official placement. Mm -hmm. uh, my first placement was Slick and Rose with Virgin Japan. Mm. Uh, but uh, that being my first, like Jay-Z on my first record, I know I'm supposed to be here because at that time, you know, you coming up, I'm broke, uh, not really living where I want to live. You know what I mean? I'm couch yeah. surfing. And I didn't know if this, I was supposed to be doing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And right there, I just knew, I was like, oh, I'm supposed to be here. You know what I mean? I did something. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Jay-Z just not gonna rap on that beat and neither yeah. is Jeezy. These two mega stars doing their shit. And like, you know, why they wanna rap on my shit? So it made me feel comfortable that I'm supposed to keep going. So that was just the makeup of the record and it just took over, man. It just was a bounce from uh, a little bit from up north and down south bounce. It just, you yeah. know, it had it had a flavor. So uh, that's where it really started, you All know. Right. Yeah. Word. Right. So uh, in 2007, can you tell us like what thoughts came into your mind when you heard the word Rico? Um, when I heard the word Rico, I was just I didn't know because I didn't really study like uh, the history of um, of criminal enterprises and things like that. But when I heard it, I knew it was something crazy. So I'm like, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We ain't this. We ain't these people. We are music people. <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? I'm right. just like. Maybe we missed something. Maybe we did something but we really not seeing. And I feel like uh, uh, it was a learning lesson because, again, our heart was in music. It wasn't in anything else. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bootlegging. It wasn't anything. We were helping artists. That's that was pure thing. Like anybody knows us, they like but not them guys. They the guys that really do music. Yeah. They not out here, you know, causing any issues and doing like this. Um, we were really in that space. Mm -hmm. You know, my whole mind was on breaking talent and climbing the ladder so people can see us you know mm -hmm. um some of the things we did just to get seen in the world you know as a as a culture of hip-hop is wear jewelry and certain clothes and drive certain cars so people have us respect for the work we're putting in yeah. you know what i mean mm -hmm. and we putting all this work in breaking these artists and doing all this and then all of a sudden we in jail for music it's like right bro what's going on here right you know what i mean so um again like it was it was scary to hear and um, I thank God that we were able to get through it and we, we, we learned what we had to go through mm -hmm. to get there. And, um, 
And I feel, I feel like it was a blessing because we're here, mm. we're breaking artists on another level and we're getting to another space. I feel like it's dope. No, nah, for sure. And that started the, um, I feel like that started what we know as the blog era as well as the mixtape era. Yeah. Because after that, you know, the blogs became popular and that became your source of where you will find music. 1,000%. And then platforms like live mixtapes, Dat Piff, you know, things like th those platforms like became very popular. And then that was like your place to, you know, get that, get the music. Yeah, and I feel like it was like, to me, I was like, bro, we had to show the world. It's not about the money, it's yeah. about music. So we went for free. Put this on the blogs. So we was just happy to be on a blog. Right. If I was on Two Dope Boys, man, I was the happiest person in the world. I didn't yeah. care about nothing. I was eating Cheez-Its and, <laughs> and noodles. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to, like, really make it. Like, I wanted to be seen. I wanted to somehow, you know, be at an award show based on the work we put in. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, Drum getting a Grammy was, like, one of the biggest things we could get. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like, wow, my man got a, he got a Grammy off Gangsta Girls, something that years ago was a bad thing in history. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. We made it through, and that's what we was trying to do in the first place. I wish we got a Grammy then. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? Uh, but yeah, man, it's just, it was, it was a, a, a situation that was unfortunate. I'm glad we got through it. I'm glad we learned a lesson. I'm glad we seen everything that came out of it, the streaming era, mm -hmm. the blog era, everything. Like I love everything about it and I'm glad we made it to the other side where uh, we made something big and, and added to the culture. Yeah, nah, for sure, yeah. for sure. So then moving forward, you guys, uh, you know, come out of that, y'all, you know, create generation now. And mm -hmm. then, you know, you guys are in this new phase of, <laughs> of creating history. Yep. Uh, can you talk about like what can, like what made you guys d create the label and, and, and move forward with that? So when we were doing uh, around the mixtape era, we started the Phileas Music Group. Mm -hmm. And I feel like at that time we signed the artist Willie the Kid, which we thought was incredible. Um, and we signed uh, uh, two, uh, two guys, one from Chicago, one from Gainesville, they were called The Replacements, mm -hmm. and a kid named Attitude, which is from Atlanta. Okay, yeah. Uh, yep. He wrote a lot of big records. Oh, yeah. um, we were just working with artists. We were building the label, Asylum, Joey, Joey IE, which is named Joey Manda. Mm -hmm. He gave us a shot uh, at a label. And um, I feel like we were doing so well, and I think the raid like, took the steam out of really what we wanted to do. Nobody was really thinking about yeah. anything but trying to survive and not be in jail for no reason. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we all just kind of like, it fizzed out. Um, like I said, at that time, me and Drum kind of just separated. We just, it was so many thoughts and so much stuff to digest mm -hmm. that we just had to get in a better space. Um, I felt a little stagnant around 2010 and 11. I took a job at Def Jam and just learning the ins and outs of it and lifting up the hood, you know, no ID helped me with a lot of it. Um, and we lifted up the hood and was like, oh, it's nitrogen in there. So, you know, after a couple of years of doing it and helping the artists, um, I wind up going on the road um, with, I had an agent, Sujit, mm -hmm. and he was putting me in some good places to do, uh, to do some residencies as DJ, mm -hmm. uh, and I was doing Vegas, I was doing LA, Houston, Dallas, I might have said that one, uh, was doing Charlotte mm -hmm. uh, in Atlantic City. Uh, when I went to Atlantic City, one time for my gig, I was driving out there from Philly, I went to visit my mom in Philly, I always do this, I'll go to up north and make sure I get to see my mother. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was driving Atlantic City, I had the radio on, like, hey, let me see what's going on up in here in this area. Yeah. And, uh, a song came on, I heard this kid that just sounded different. And uh, I called the radio station and Diamond Cuts, which was one of our friends, were like, yo, who's that on the radio? She was like, it's the kid from Philly named Uzi. I'm helping him out a little bit. And he dope. I was like, yo, when I come back from my gig, I want to meet him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, I wind up coming back to Philly, meeting him. Uh, I met him, I met him at, uh, I met him at this crib in Maniunk, which, which was actually the studio listen to some records. Uh, after I did all that, I came back to Atlanta. I was like, Drum, listen, we should try this shit again. I found this artist, he dope as hell. I think he the one, just trust me on this. And we started Generation Now again, uh, just based off those thought process, like that thought process of, hey man, we tried it again. Right. Hopefully it worked, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I just knew this time it was something special. 
Um, the whole time we were doing Philly's music group, everybody was like, man, y'all got to start with a Philly artist or Atlanta artist. Mm. How y'all start with somebody from Michigan? Nobody know. Yeah. This, you know what I'm saying? It was just Willie the whole, Kid was hard, though. Dope as hell, man, bro. He to this crazy. day, it's my man. We still Yo. speak. Like, he's crazy, bro. I mean, he's got one of the most distinct voices to me, man. Wow. I think he was early, like, and I think so, like, if you're thinking, like, how the Griselda's out now and J. Oh, Cole and man. Kendra, he was that then. That's real. And That's I think so that if we were so early, and I feel like if we had stayed in motion, he might have got that chance. Yeah. I felt like the raid and the split of me and the team yeah. and everything, all that had like a demise with his career. Mm. And I feel like, you know, it's nobody's fault. It was just the history of it. You know what I mean? And I feel like being so dope, he's still getting a chance now. He's putting out independent records. They still going. Um, and, I, and I just feel like, you know, history made itself. You know what I mean? And I feel like um, Uzi was that second coming of the label and he just took off and that's where that's where we really got into the exec business world Word, yeah. word. and then you produce a couple of joints I mean you 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 I know uh, uh, well you produce like a bunch of joints like yeah. for Uzi as well yeah so early on yeah. like I was engineering and producing for yeah. him okay until I found like I, I noticed that I can't engineer for him because I need to be able to watch it and help it gotcha. engineering I'll be getting so caught in actually recording it uh, so I had Slade the monster. I don't know if y'all heard of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Slade was recording at first, then we brought in Keisha, um, and then I started overseeing it. But we all, me and him, always have a gel production and lyric wise. It's yeah. just an energy about it. We we two birthday days apart. Ah, huh, okay. Um, so we just we know an energy. We know what we want to hear. Uh, we trust each other, and and that's where uh, it got to a point where I could just make the records and we both trust it. And right. all of them did well because yeah. it's just a synergy. That's yeah. what people, people will buy into the synergy of it. Mm -hmm. So that was just um, what we really, that's, that's how it worked. Y'all you know? had some joints together. I mean, the money yeah, we, had a lot, we had some joints. Yeah, we had some joints. We still got some crazy joints coming. Yeah. So I think it just, as long as we stick in there and continue to make this music, the history will keep building. Like right. he has a chance to be uh, I know people be mad when I say this is a bad word, uh, the, the next Lil Wayne or, mm. you know, the new, he's Uzi, you yeah. know what I'm saying? I mean, he's definitely yeah. a generational artist, like, yes, sir. for yes, sure, sir. so I know what you yes, mean sir. when you say that, like, because he's definitely, like, yeah. there's, he's one of one there in terms go. of who he is. And yeah. No, yep. I, I get it. That's what we're building on. Yeah, I get it, I get it. Um, how did you uh, discover uh, Jack Harlow? Uh, I, to I told this story, but never on camera. Uh, I think Jack was in Atlanta. Uh, he was working with KY Engineering, which is a close friend of mine. Uh, and he he uh, he was telling us about it, but I never really kind of like, you know, I just didn't buy into it. I was so mm -hmm. engulfed on making history mm -hmm. uh, with one artist. I was like, damn, we're gonna have to expand. But I think that I was hearing that he always wanted to be signed to DJ Drama, mm -hmm. right? And by some way, Drown was, you know, chopping it up with him and doing his thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he's like, yo, I want y'all to meet this kid. And I had heard some records right before I finally popped up in the studio and mm -hmm. Drown presented them. And he did them with uh, one of our artists, Scheme, which is another talented writer. Okay, yeah. um, and I wasn't sold at first because I was hearing, I was hearing something like Jack wanted to be bigger than what the records were being displayed upon. Mm -hmm. uh, so when he came to the studio to meet us, um, I realized that uh, dude was uh, really, really articulate and knew exactly what he was doing and it reminded me of Uzi so much because meeting both of them, they knew exactly where they were gonna be, mm -hmm. how they were gonna do it, and how much help they needed to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and talking to him, you know, he came, to he came to the studio, he had a producer with him, uh, named Two For One, and Two For One, uh, he was like, you know, in one of Jack's lyrics, he was like, yeah, and I brought my little own little Metro, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, it's like, oh, you got your Metro beats with you, okay. I'm like, okay, I know that I'm familiar with this. Metro's my family. Mm. I'm like, mm, I'm, f I'm familiar somehow, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm hearing him talk. He's talking about his favorite movies and he's talking about what he wants to do with his career. And he's like, bro, I really can rap. Mm. And we like, we buying into it, we really get it. Um, and then we just made a decision to sign him. Um, since he had his own team, again, we talked earlier, I'm not the person that wants to 
impose on what everybody else already has. Mm -hmm. They were already making music together. I just wanted to come in and just uh, just hand over like some you know good advice mm -hmm. to him to to move forward. And, um, and as I built a relationship with him, I, I really understood where how dope he is, bro. He really loves music. Mm -hmm. He's really into it, and it just they, those two guys remind me of each other in different worlds. Wow. They're just very convicted on what they want to do, mm -hmm. and um, that's the thing I look for the most. It's like, who's them? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Who 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 are those who are those people that really are like you look at them and it's like they're just looking past you. Right. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? Right. Into this whole like vision, and um, and that's how that's how it was discovered for right. sure. He's ruffling a lot of feathers right now uh, with his comment. He said he's the best white rapper since Eminem. Yeah. yeah. I think in rap, we should be able to say anything we want to. You know what I mean? And as t top, top tier rappers, we are ready for war at any point. Not to say he's going to war with anybody, but we should be able to say anything. I should be able to go in this camera and say I'm the best DJ ever. Nobody Absolutely. can fuck with me. Yeah. I should be able to say that and not have somebody challenge me all the time. I mean, hip-hop <laughs> you know hip -hop was literally created off of that. Right. I mean, Cats was in the park like, all right, like, I'm DJing better than you across the street at that park. Okay? Right. I'm a better MC and I'm moving this crowd than you are. So, right. yeah, just. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm, I'm in the street and, I, you know, as a competitor, you know, I feel like, I feel like Kobe. I feel like. LeBron, I'm that Absolutely. person that I'm that person that'll tell anybody, yo, as a DJ producer, nobody's better than me in the world. Not one, because why I do equally everything great. I make great hip hop records, I make hit records, I can DJ my ass off in a mm -hmm. party, and I'm a different DJ. I'm not the DJ that don't talk. Mm -hmm. I'm the one to perform. I'm the one to come out on the stage, had a crowd rocking, like mm -hmm. I'm a different beast. So I don't feel like it's nobody better than me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can say that and not have to worry about Somebody be like, well, I'm better. You want to battle? It's like, I'm not going to battle you. Yeah. I just know. Right. I put in the work for it. Like, I study this. Yeah. I do, I'm, I'm that guy right. when it comes to that. Like, I'm him for real. Right. Right. But, you know, I should be able to say that. He should be able to say whatever he wants to say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. And if it comes with some battling, cool. We cool with that. Whoever want to step up to the plate, I'm sure he's saying it in regards of still having something ready to go to war with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then, man, with, you know, being, being innovative, you know, across the board, um, I know that you uh, stepped into the tech world as well. Yes, sir. Um, and have your own app, Tomorrow. Can you please talk to us about that app? And Yeah, you know, so what? Tomorrow app uh, is a marketplace for creatives and clients to find each other. Um, this started out as uh, my girl Kayla. She knows... Uh, she knows a, a, a girl that was a close friend of hers that was styling. She was doing great styling jobs. And there were some times where she didn't have gigs, so she had to door dash to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. And she, it, was all, it was always a pain point of creatives not being able to stay in a field. And we tried to figure out a way that we could give back to help creatives stay in a field and also help f uh, clients find new photographers and videographers and managers and mm -hmm. new producers. And it's just such a hard thing to do in the social media world. You got to go through all these hula hoops. Right. You don't know who's tricking you, who's going to pay you or not. So we wanted to come up with something that was foolproof, no social media part of it, a portfolio, a portfolio that you can use um, to, to show off your talent. Mm -hmm. And we turned it into Tomorrow App. So it was that marketplace that, you know, creatives can go in there and put put their uh, portfolio up mm -hmm. and clients could come and say oh i like shorty's pictures can i hire you wow. and it's no talking it's here's my fee mm -hmm. you know when that when that fee's paid in there it goes into a holding tank until the job is done mm -hmm. when the job is done you press pay it pays out it's no chasing nobody wow. around okay. it's no net 30 it's no net 90 none of that extra shit yeah it's just it pays out as early as tomorrow okay so i know that people love hearing i'm gonna get paid tomorrow right. <laughs> you right. know what i'm saying no, i might get paid today yeah. you know what i'm saying and um and that's what we made it for also those clients that just can't find people to do their album cover mm -hmm. or they're looking for somebody for their artist to mm -hmm. do something so we started out, it was really broad. We was going after people that wanted to DJ weddings and take photographers. I would go on places, people would come to me and say, yo, I want to get in the music business. Mm -hmm. I didn't have an answer. I would always do panels and people would say, at the end, they'd stand up with the mic and say, yo, how I get on? <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? And you know, 
I don't want to say that's the bullshit, bullshit answer, but it's the only answer we always know how to do because we be frantic when we get that question because yeah. we don't know how to answer it. Right. No person right. I know that sit up here and be like, yo, you got to work hard. You know, God got you. <laughs> right. You know, it's all, you know, it's true, but it's like it's the flea off answer. Right. Be consistent. So, <laughs> so I wanted to have an answer where I'm like, hey, man, you could go to Tomorrow app mm -hmm. and be on in a couple minutes with the right choices. Word. And that's why I built this. So, uh, people will have a chance to really get into their field and stay in their field, man. It's a tough work for us. I'm a creative. It's built by creatives. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that's my way of giving back to the world something that I always had a problem with is answering how do I get on. Word, word. <laughs> you know so, what I'm saying? So, so almost like a task rabbit before creatives. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And you know, it, people always like have to compare it so you have something to understand it with. Mm -hmm. But it's more of a community of people as well. Mm -hmm. It's not as stiff as jobs. Right. It's a community without right. social. It's like she has the portfolio, you had a portfolio, he got the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And we're moving around with like a business card, but it's like, you know, sometimes we don't want to be talking and, you know, we got to go out, have a meeting, and then, you know, people just in a space and getting looked at differently because mm -hmm. you, you know, it's just different, bro. It's like, yeah. you know, we, we wanted to have it in a space where it's like, hey, man, I'm getting to the work. And that's that, you yeah. know what I mean? Word. Yeah. What are some of the biggest challenges that you face so far um, within this tech realm, you know, that you're in now? Uh, some of the biggest challenges, uh, number one, is uh, being fully black owned. Uh, we see a lot of people going out there and they're talking about apps that aren't fully owned uh, by black people. And I feel like it took a long time for us to get in the tech world. Mm. And um, just to be owned fully black, um, we did some crowdfunding with, uh, with Start Engine. Mm -hmm. um, it helped allow us to get family and friends in early on tech and, and, um, and investments. And I felt like during the pandemic and then even in 2021, which I feel like the, it's called the pre-post -pan, uh, pandemic, which was like, we weren't out of it yet, right. but we were still trying to figure out what's next yeah. and getting people to, uh, to invest. Uh, I think Start Engine was a good start and just going to people. Um, second is uh, getting people to understand it uh, or really buy into ideas, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Uh, it's hard to convince people that this is a new wave that's gonna help you and better your life. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, we, we don't have to battle with Instagram, but a lot of times I see people uh, down other apps, like we got Fanbase, which is Isaac Hayes. Yeah. So and it's fully guys. black owned and it's he's he's giving a message to people that we can become paid creatives and influencers mm -hmm. in this way and he's fighting other social media apps to do it right. or just fighting every day to do that and we shouldn't have to do that right. our ideas should be able to you know it's like going to the store or going to barnes and nobles and we pick up books if I'm reading a book, I look next to me, somebody's reading another book, and they're like, yo, that book hot? Yeah, what you read? That's hot, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. This is how we should be moving. It yeah. shouldn't be like, I don't like that idea. Right. I'm, I'm cool right here. Right, right. You know what I mean? And the nature of humans, like we, we, get into, we get into what we like and we never leave. We should be able to expand on the idea of, I like this app, but I also like this one too. Mm -hmm. And I'm also gonna get paid here, and I'm also gonna go um, do some stuff over here. Those are some of the biggest challenges. Um, talking to people isn't because like, as soon as I get in front of people, uh, I try to show them how I'm trying to help. Okay. You know, you know, either take the hand or, you know, you don't, mm -hmm. you know? So I just think that those challenges are that being black in tech and just, you know, people, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you this one cause I, I never speak on it, but the last one is being in music and getting a bad name, it's like, they don't, they think that we're all gonna run off on a plug. You know what I mean? When right. we do these situations, it's like, no, we have a legit business. We're doing legit things. I don't want you to feel like you're gonna invest in this and you're gonna lose all your money. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna fight with your money to get to the top. This is what I'm doing. And you know, we get a bad name in hip hop because people look at us like that. Mm -hmm. We run off on the plug. Uh, we all violent. We all this, we all that. We gotta kind of kill all that noise. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, no, nah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's that crab in the bucket mentality, you know what I mean? Where yep. it's like, 
we feel like, you know, we see other, you know, folks of color doing something and it's like, well, no, nah, they, they can't do that. I, I got to be the one doing this or I got to be first. You Facts. Know? And I want people to know that we can do this shit. Like, you know what I mean? Just me having an app, I don't want people to look at it like, okay, he made a few dollars, so of course he can make an app. I want everybody to know that they can make an app. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, I want you to know that there's a lane open for all this. We can't look at things how they look, used to look at it, like, I can't walk in there because my hair is blonde. I can't do this because I'm slick back. Like, you hear your, grand, your grandparents and everybody tell you these stories of how they couldn't do nothing because that wasn't in. Yeah, you right, know, right. dreaming wasn't something you could do. Go get a job. So I want people to know that we can be in tech. You know what I mean? We can be in music. We also don't have to keep doing clothes, liquor, and these type of brands mm -hmm. if we don't want to. We yeah. can do whatever. We can make a camera if we want. So I'm just, I'm in that space with the app, just showing people like, if you never give on the app, just know that another black man was able to come through and a black woman were able to come through mm -hmm. and make something that they say we couldn't make. Yeah. You know what I mean? Word. Yeah. Uh, Cannon, with having, you know, so much success over a, a long period of time from, you know, you said your first placement was, you know what I'm saying? You got Jay-Z, you yeah. know what I mean? On the Jeezy and Jay-Z. I mean, you know, you've been a part of, you know, uh, cultivating this mixtape culture and taking it, you know, to heights, you know, beyond belief. Yep you discover artists and have taken artists with no names and have you know made them platinum selling artists what keeps you motivated to keep you know like coming with something new because it's so easy to have success and then just keep doing what works so what 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 you know like where's the motivation to now jump into this new challenge of the app and the creative world and all of that yeah so uh, the motivation, one, is uh, people saying we can't do it hmm. and we can't do it over again. It's like we bring you Uzi Vert and they're like, ha, ha, that's cool, do it again. Hmm. We bring you Jack, ha, 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 do it again. It's the song and dance. Yeah. You know, I'm not proving nothing, but you're actually telling me we can't do this. We're masters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're saying we can't make an app. We'll make another app. Ah. We'll make another bike. Yeah. We'll make an electric car. Mm -hmm. What don't you want us to do? Oh, y'all don't want to fund us to do it. We don't have no capital to do it. We're going to figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And that, the, that part of history drives me. Uh, seeing people get a chance. Like we, again, we didn't have as mentors. Like we taught ourselves. We're giving people a chance. Mm -hmm. Like these artists are talented. We're not getting, giving them a chance. We need to give them a chance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Those are the things that drive me now. I took my ego out of the space where I don't want to be the best producer. I don't want to be the best exec ever. Um, I just want to be that person that made history and brought something to the game. I don't want to cry about nothing on the internet. I want to talk about what I'm not getting. I just want to be able to produce these things. Mm -hmm. And as long as I'm a part of the history, if I'm part of it and 10% of it, you know what I'm saying? I'm a part of the history. Yeah. That's what I came here for. That's all. Right. Yeah. Do you ever have moments where you sit back and like relish on like your accomplishments and, and, and just like, damn, I, I really can't believe that like we really did that. Like, do you ever have times where you're able to reflect and do that? Some, sometimes I do reflect, but it's a reflection from a standpoint of uh, what us as human beings, we go to these things where we doubt ourselves and we get the strongest it's the strongest of us, you know what I mean? We doubt ourselves, we go through these things. And the mental health is a challenge with everybody. Mm. Um, you, can, you, you can be, you know, uh, uh, influenced by drugs, you can be influenced by bad uh, energy from growing up, you can be influenced by just social media, you can be influenced by anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like uh, when you have those doubt spots, you have to go back and look at things and like, bro, you actually did that. <laughs> that's that's helping me like oh yeah 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 don't don't fall into depression right don't fall into that you actually created that look how much hard work went into mm -hmm. doing that and look what came out of it yeah so I think that uh th those are the things that I kind of use when I look back and be like oh snap remember when we did that that was crazy yeah we did trap or die <laughs> right you know what I'm saying oh right. we did circulate Oh, snap. Right. I'm going to go back and say, oh, we went through the raid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Things could be much worse. Yeah. So it was things that anytime I feel myself feeling like, man, 
it's that. Yeah. You know, I use those things. No, I think it's difficult, like, being the visionary, but then also being the person who can really get down and do the work also. Yeah. Because then, like, you're always beating yourself up because you see like what you could have done better and you 1000%. You know. I'm I'm a critique master. I <laughs> y'all critique everything I got going on, bro. I I don't like to hear records go out cuz I'll pick I'll get on like, man, I could have mastered that better. Word. I could have got uh Leslie to mix that a little differently. I could have got uh, I could have did that drum a little better. It's yeah. always going to be that just cuz the perfection of being a creative. Mm-hmm. Um, and being able to a- actually put my hands in and fix it. Mm-hmm. It's helping me go through. Right. And I see other people, they be like, man, yo, I'm going through this and that. I'm like, bro, y'all see how far y'all came? Huh, yeah. Like, you ain't going through this at three years old. Right. You're 42, right. going crazy. And you go, like, you're right, let me get myself together. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's basically what I be doing. It's like, you know, everybody deal with things differently. Mm-hmm. But I know with me, I try, to be, I try to fight through. Like, yeah, I know that's happening. That's hurting a little bit. I'm going to get here because I did all that. Right. Even if it ain't accomplishments in your business field if you accomplished eating better if you accomplished start working out or you accomplished uh in your relationship with your wife and you kind of like you got through the bullshit y'all was doing and you got to a better place all those things you need to look back on and be like oh yeah i, got, I can get through this i did all that right. you know what i mean yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's all how you look at it some people are going through trials and tribulations in a hood um, I was just listening to Dirk's song and, uh, with the kids on it, mm-hmm. with uh, J. Cole. Okay, yeah. And I think that's a perfect motivation song. It's like, bro, you, you're turning around, you're trying to do the best thing, and every time you turn around, somebody grabbing you back out, it's like, you know, in the respect level for it. So I feel like um, we got to get back into that, that vibe of the culture where we're able to motivate. So we don't have so much pressure mm-hmm. and so much extra mental yeah. Uh, strain that we got to fix mm-hmm. you know I think that's brought to us by uh, the inflicted wounds that we carry mm-hmm. and we need to fix those things we need to kind of like bring uplifting things that we just help you know what I mean every time I turn on social media I got to block another page because it's something that I don't want to see right you know what I mean right, right. and I just want to I'm happy that since social uh, since uh, the pandemic ca- happened I'm flipping through pages and everybody's a financial guru all of a sudden. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Right or wrong, it's like, man, you actually being, you actually talk about something other than gossip. Right. I'm rolling. Right. You know what I mean? Or yeah. somebody's talking about AI or somebody's talking about, that means that we got more than enough people out here studying, trying to be better. Yeah, no, nah, that's so right. I'm, I'm rolling with that. The yeah. pandemic uh, definitely opened that, uh, the whole like, you know, learning new skills and all that. Cause remember the narrative was kind of like, oh, if you came out the pandemic without a new skill, like you losing. That's you know facts, I mean? <laughs> facts. And, but everybody got, like I said, whoever we choose to be like, oh, they full of shit or whatever. I'm glad that people are taking that step. Yeah. Even if you're talking on a bullshit level, mm-hmm. I'm happy you talking positive bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's just what I'm on. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Word. Right. So, Cannon, what's the latest and greatest, man? What you what you got coming up? Uh, the latest and greatest with me is just continue to break these artists. Uh, of course, the well anticipated Uzi album Jack just dropped, uh, and we got a new artist Carvina, okay. which I keep pushing. She's you know everything. I again, I always tend to be too passionate and say that she's like Mary J and Whitney Houston mixed together. Word. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm super passionate about our artist. Um, Sonny Digital is another person that I feel like just needs a chance. He really, he's really he been an artist his whole life. He wants to be an artist. Such I think the narrative is always with us is 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 um, is he a, a producer turned rapper. And I want to eliminate that because yeah. there's some people that been rappers their whole life. They right. just didn't get a chance to really push it out because everybody want to beat so right. I'm just happy to be you know in a mentor type space for him to help him move uh, help him go to the next chapter of his career um, and just find a new artist man you know the, the tech world is something I'm really really happy about um, I got my toes wet I'm not all the way in there but hopefully we're making it through I can meet more people um, and just come up with new bright ideas man I think that's just the next level and just continue to uh, to enlighten people in the culture about what hip hop should be about. Okay. You know what I mean? Word, word. Well, on that note, if you could take a, a, a moment to enlighten the users just on, you know, just give them some game on, you know what I'm saying? Like, 
what they can be doing to get to their goals and, and you know. Right. So if you're worried about your goals and you worried about, or you're thinking about anything you need to be doing, uh, my first piece of advice is to be yourself. Second piece of advice is learning your strengths. When you're learning your strengths, that's how you get to a place where you eliminate everything that's in the way. When I said I had to eliminate trying to be the best producer and the best this, that was all ego and opinion based. Once I got that out the way, I was able to say, okay, I'm this good at this, I'm this good at this, and this is what I need to be doing. I'm able to alleviate anything that's, uh, can, it's just a stop sign in my way, you know what I mean? So those are two pieces of advice I like. Um, always be a go-getter. Uh, people are out here thinking you can't do anything you want to do. You know what I mean? You can do whatever you want to do. Don't let them tell you you can't. Um, and, and those are my advice, man. That's it. All the life that we live, oh. This bitch does everything we do.